Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Sanjeev Sablokhia from Palam Vihar, Gurgaon. Uh, in my short trip to India to look after my father, I had uh, really wanted to talk to Dr. Mulail. Uh, in my view, the preeminent expert in epidemiology in India. He's a very accomplished uh, you know, thinker in the subject. He's from the Christian Medical College, Vellore. You would have read about him. You can search about him on Google. Uh, and you will realize how accomplished he is and his views. So uh, I am particularly interested in his views because they were, uh, when I heard them first, quite different to the panicky views and others that were coming out from many of parts of Indian media. Uh, welcome about uh, <laughs> Dr. Mulel uh, uh, to this little chat. I'm happy to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let's start. Now, you know, in, in, in Australia, which is where uh, I was in the Indian Administrative Service, resigned, went to Australia, got a, became an economist. Uh, I looked at the uh, planning for pandemics in Australia, very comprehensive, uh, pretty much like the European and American comprehensive plans. And there was obviously no mention of lockdowns and so on. Uh, was there any such pandemic plan in India? I have struggled to locate one, unfortunately. Did, did, did we have a plan and did we follow it? We did not, but we had a kind of a disaster management act and, you know, yes. and that as necessarily gave enormous power to the government machinery hmm. to tread on everybody else in the name of safety for the public. Hmm. And so that was used liberally. And this particular concoction called nationwide lockout was a product of this kind of a panic, mm. plus not knowing what else to do. Right. We were going by the pictures that emanated from the TV from uh, European countries mm. and uh, not much facts. So that is a tragedy. Yeah, in fact, I have, I operate a group of 100, uh, uh, more than 100 retired uh, uh, Indian administrative officers, all secretaries in the government and so on. And I wrote articles to, uh, and I shared with Rajiv Goba, who's the cabinet secretary, he's my batchmate, and I didn't get a response from him. He saw the article, but the IS officers uh, were all telling me uh, one simple thing. Sanjeev, why are you asked, why are you trying to, to stop these uh, lockdowns when all over the West, that is what they are doing. So their, their, their question, they never had any logical approach, uh, the Indian Administrative Service, the secretary, the cabinet secretary, and the, all the government officers. They simply followed the West. And the West, unfortunately, followed China, in this case, which is the Wuhan uh, model, rather than the standard model of uh, you know, a well-considered risk management of these things. So you're right. Okay. So this is where India was. No, because I have, uh, I'm very familiar with the Disaster Management Act. I was a deputy commissioner, I, you know, managed Indian uh, you know, system for a long time. So let's move on to the overall pandemic governance system. Uh, are you a part of the system in, in some way, like some committee or what this, was there an advisory committee in India or is there an advisory committee that uh, sort of recommends these lockdowns and so on? Well, peripherally, remember I am a retired person. Hmm. And, but I was still holding the post of the chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the National Institute of Epidemiology. Mm. I was also a member of the National Technical Advisory Group on Immunization. And as a consequence, I was there in a position to uh, make my opinions heard. And uh, I, in fact, volunteered my, myself and met the Apex Committee, where Vinod Paul is the person, chairperson, mm -hmm. and explained in the beginning what is in it for what we have to expect from this pandemic mm -hmm. and uh, our expectations. If pandemic is there already in India, we expect so many deaths, and this is the way it will pan out. Mm. And uh, see, the problem comes up with the fact that uh, we say we need to do something. You got to realize the reality is that you can't do a thing. This bug will spread, and right. and and we, we have seen it happening. And you know, I don't have to justify standard what uh, uh, epidemiology really standard virus virus. So yeah. the fortunate thing about this virus 
that this is only nasty to the elderly. Mm. Yes. It completely spared children, seldom affected young people. And as age progressed, there was an exponential increase in mortality. Yes. Which was, and which was enacted in every part of the world. Absolutely. So that was something very saving grace, I should say. The second thing is people who got sick, recovered, and went back to the work normally. Yes. That is a sure good sign. Mm. And the sign is that it has got a good immunity generating ability because people are fighting back. Yes. The, there is the only difficulty we had with this thing. This is a double-edged sword, the large number of subclinical infections. Mm. To an epidemiologist, it means two things. On one hand, the immunity must be excellent, hmm. okay? Because so many people don't even show clinical manifestation. Number two, this is going to be even more difficult to control, to control Absolutely. than even influenza. Indeed, 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 indeed. Yeah, so the, my question is, Vinod Paul is a member of the, uh, uh, what is it called? The, uh, what is it? New Planning Commission, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm forgetting the name. <laughs> what IOG is it? Uh, some IOG. Niti IOG. Niti IOG. Policy, policy. Yes. I, Vivek Debra is a very good friend. He's also on that and so on. So, what did these people do? Vivek Debra is a very sensible guy. Uh, we know that Paul, I don't know personally. Uh, what, did he not take your advice? Why are these people, uh, why did no. they behave this way? The problem is, I think there was a um, confident approach towards this that we can somehow get rid of the virus. Ah, ah, ah I see. Ah, that ah, once ah. you fall into the trap, hmm. containment was the mandra, hmm. and you're trying to do the impossible. Impossible, yes. And putting everybody in trouble in the name of containment. Hmm. And that's how the all the lockout and the migrants suffering, everything yes. came out. Everything came out. Yes. So the strategy was faulty. Yes, I think that's true in Australia. You know, you, I don't know whether you're familiar. Australia has uh, been absolutely crazy, much worse than India in many ways. So we'll talk about that maybe if there's a moment. I, I've suffered a lot <laughs> and I've, I've resigned my job. I've been fighting there, uh, you know, politically now, uh, starting a new political party to fight this tyranny. But uh, yeah, you're right. I think what's ha what happens is uh, this is like an intuitive thing that, okay, this is a very bad thing. Let's stop it. And then there is uh, the absence of the fundamental knowledge uh, which I'll come to uh, in a minute. Uh, maybe I wish this is the right place to discuss it, actually, before we go to the, my third question. You know, the, uh, the, the big discoveries, because I'm not an epidemiologist nor virologist, but I have a decent science background. I was a science trained scholar. I did biology, physics, chemistry, maths, and everything else. And, uh, you know, I, I studied this very well, but I'd never studied in detail. But then I realized two fundamental things were essential for me to understand why this virus cannot be contained. And the first was Donald Henderson, uh, Donald Henderson's uh, you know, lecture, which I heard of 2010, where they, they were reviewing the H1N1, this is the uh, swine flu. And, they, and he basically said that, look, I could not find the index case for even the smallpox in the 60s when he was trying to eradicate smallpox. They were trying to have the barriers across the USA. He says, if, if you don't get the index case, the very first case that enters the USA, right? Then what you're doing is you're fighting an impossible battle. So, and he says that of the 50 cases that I studied, I could not find a single index case. Therefore, the cases had already infiltrated into the USA through partially symptomatic smallpox people. Smallpox, which is so visible and evident, also has the stage when you people can, when the traveler can pass through undetected. And once they get, get through the system, it's already in the community. You should not even dream of stopping it. So his point was that in the 60s, we discovered this. The very thought of stop trying to stop these kind of pandemics is, 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 uh, has been completely uh, you know, it made outdated essentially in the field of epidemiology. And then Sunetra Gupta, I, I think I'll talk to her about this in a bit more detail, as the most amazing say, uh, you know, and common sense thing. He says that uh, just like you know, we want children to get some infection so that they develop immunity, uh, similarly, you know, we had the story of uh, people, uh, the Westerners going to the Native Americans and, you know, having spreading, uh, spreading disease, same in Aborigines in Australia. The same principle applies on a daily basis when we are traveling internationally, that we are bringing and sharing bugs with each other. 
And because these are mild bugs, we are actually strengthening the immunity. She basically said that there has never been a higher level of immunity in world's history in the entire mankind, because we have been sharing each other's bugs, cross-fertilizing with this and developing immunity, which actually means that you should not only, not only is it impossible to stop this through border control, but actually you should want, you want more border, border open openness which is what Sweden did, in order to make sure that everybody in the world is as rapidly you know, developing in immunity as possible. Of course, her uh, critique, uh, her commentary of this sort was uh, you know, ripped apart by the media saying, she's saying, let it rip and all that kind of stuff and uh, criticized very badly. But I think these are, in my view, two fundamental insights into epidemiology or virology that I've gained from this uh, entire study. What are your views on these fundamental you know, insights of Donald Henderson and Sunetra Gupta? Uh, there is a problem with this, uh, this particular kind of disease, which is spread through respiratory route. Mm. That when you speak, you cough, and you uh, transmit. And humans are very gregarious, and mm. we, we love to be with people. Had we been like orangutans, each one finding mm. its own tree and sitting, mm. Corona would have no chance to spread. Right. Mm. And uh, so this Indian context is even more because mm. for sustenance, you have to get out. So in other words, this, this is a ridiculous thinking in a world like this, you can actually isolate yourself. I mean, it is not possible. And uh, as a reality, what you should do is, in public health, there is one issue they ask, one of the important question, can you do something about it? And when it comes to spread of this thing, the question was, can you do something about it after it left China? Hmm. Nothing. Exactly. That's the good question to ask. Can you do something about it? So once that is over, the next question will be, all right, how do we reduce damage? Hmm. Exactly. And in the damage control, we have a lot of measures we can do. Hmm. Make sure the hospitals are available hmm. for those who are sick and only those who are sick. And make sure that, see, we lose in India about 10 million people. Every year. And every year. Yes. And then that means much more number seek health care for various mm. conditions. Mm. And they'll, some of them get cured, some of them die. Mm. Now, when you suddenly stop all this activity and chase one bug, mm. which only kills elderly, mm. something wrong with your whole thinking process, right? Yes, yes. yes. What about the children who develop acute pneumonia? How do you look after them? Yes ruptured appendix, all kinds of things are there. Yes. So somehow we lost complete sight of what is going on. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. And it is sad to repeat the whole thing. Now that we have come out of it, the point of repeating is we should never repeat it again. Absolutely. <laughs> you understand? Yes. And, uh, and this horror we watched in silence. And because we had to react in gen, gen, as a gentleman, we were not obscene in our discussions and we tried to convey as peacefully as possible. You know, what saddens me, even now, mm -hmm. there are many people who believe that lockdown was the best solution for this whole catastrophe. And I don't, they don't realize lockdown actually multiply the tragedy due to the virus to a very large extent. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, so I think what you just said is exactly what Martin Kaldoff has uh, mentioned uh, repeatedly and also John Ioannidis and Jay Bhattacharya in their articles and so on, that basically we have had two kinds of harms from the lockdowns. Um, one is in, in, in most countries, and there's so much evidence coming about it right now, we've actually increased the number of COVID deaths itself. We've actually cause people to cluster together, to go indoor, to have less vitamin D and many other, you know, and uh, just the COVID itself has actually had worse outcomes because of the lockdowns. 
Of course, the other part, as you rightly mentioned, there are so many other diseases that uh, were simply not, uh, were basically shut down. The treatment was more or less shut down for these other things, which are causing an extra uh, your, uh, piece of damage, which could have been avoided. And I, I'll come to the data in a second. I'm working on a cost benefit analysis uh, with Professor Gigi Foster of New South Wales University. Uh, I just, uh, this, this brings me to the, my initial question, which I was going to start before the you know epidemiology of this whole thing or the or the theory of the whole thing, which is you've summarized very well. Can you do something about it, and then what can you actually do to reduce the damage? These are the two fundamental questions that I think uh, science needed to inform, and and I think in the in the panic and hysteria, uh, India forgot about that. So what uh, I am I, I haven't uh, you know when I was in the IAS, well, one of the things we never did was a cost benefit analysis of any policy. We don't have a tradition of a cost benefit analysis in India. In Australia, there is a very strong tradition and also in many parts of the world. Uh, what uh, did, has, has a cost benefit approach ever been taken to pandemics in the past in India? And is there a systematic way to, to teach people how to do it in the policy circles? We have attempted to do cost benefit analysis in terms of infectious diseases and there are several studies that we have. Okay. Now the response to pandemic mm. is different from the pandemic itself. Mm. And if you tease out this two, <clears throat> two pandemic costs would have not have been very high. Mm. The response to the pandemic I think was more damaging to individuals and families yes. and their well-being. Indeed. Now, remember, there is one hidden cause that none of the analysis ever picks up. Mm -hmm. When in India, people have run out of money mm -hmm. because they don't have a salary or water, mm -hmm. they easily get access to money from a money lender. Mm -hmm. And many of them are deeply indebted to money lenders. Mm -hmm. And these bloodsuckers mm -hmm. actually drain you for years and years. Mm -hmm. Okay, now these are hidden costs yes. for your well being or the family. Yes. And I know individuals who have suffered from this mm. because their little business has gone on. Yes. And there are again other hidden things that we can't really understand. For example, CMC Velour is a single hospital which attracts a lot of people from all over the world, mm. India. Mm. And one thing they noticed was, as soon as the lockdown was lifted, the number of cancer cases increased and all of them had gone into higher stages. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, the delay, and that was a tremendous cause. We will mm. never be able to compute it, so mm. on and so forth. Mm. So I think we, the technology is there, mm. And uh, we can't go by GDP and, and things like that for on top of how much of impact. Mm -hmm. It is the family level mm -hmm. you know, yes. that that it, the impact that is need to be measured. Yes, yes. Because I know so many people made money with the pandemic. Yes. Yes, there were a lot of uh, scamsters and people, you know, exploiting the PPE, uh, the masks, and uh, the supply of various. Uh, Vaccines now, I think, is also one of the scams. Uh, but anyway, we'll leave that, that for now. But you're right, there have been uh, the winners and losers. And the losers are generally the ones uh, uh, who are already uh, be below the middle class. So you, you pointed out correctly. And that's exactly the point. So I think the cost benefit, rightly, as you said, it's not just about GDP. It's never about GDP. And uh, you know, there's a strong tradition there. So the, the cost benefit that Gigi Foster and uh, Paul Fritchers of London School of Economics, they created, I'm actually updating that as we speak. That's part of my, you know, when I have a spare moment from my father's cancer. My father's cancer, by the way, is exactly, in my view, very similar uh, to, the, to the issues that happened during the lockdown because he was, we basically sheltered him at home. And my brother looked after him, fed him when I was in, in Australia. And uh, uh, they, were, they, they were saved from the COVID because at their age, it's very dangerous. But in the process, I think a few symptoms that my father had indicated, uh, but they were not very serious at that stage. We lost the opportunity about six months before uh, we actually had finally detected the cancer. So you're right, there is a, he had, by this time it's, it's spread everywhere. 
it's gone to the brain, it's everywhere. So he's, uh, you know, in a pretty terminal kind of situation, we are fighting very heavily. So you're right, this, uh, the, the lockdowns have had enormous effects all over the world, uh, cancer being definitely one. Uh, in Australia, the deaths from cancers have shot up dramatically after the lockdowns. Uh, the deaths from diabetes related diseases have shot up. So there are this kind of uh, data coming out from all over the world that I uh, will be analyzing as part of this uh, cost benefit analysis. And I think my, my point about the CBA was that if you know, uh, we, we should actually institutionalize the requirement for a CBA, even if a short three page CBA is done cost benefit analysis before a pandemic uh, policy is announced, that would at least inform somebody about, and, and it should be transparent, it should be published, it should be updated as more information comes in. So I think the, the uh, proper planning for pandemic in India, like any other part of the world is important. A proper cost benefit is very important. These are policy issues that I think we should uh, uh, you know, support in India. Uh, I'm obviously supporting a political party called uh, Swan Bharat Party. Uh, you might not be familiar. It's a liberal party of India. And I definitely, you know, recommend these kind of policies to the party. Now, I also had some other few technical questions. Uh, one more technical question, which is uh, I studied this thing about uh, cross-reactivity and uh, trained immunity. And uh, uh, I wrote an article in Times of India blog of mine. Uh, my understanding is that India also had a relatively low death rate. Now, this is a question actually I should not prejudge because... Uh, Let's start by asking the question, do you think that the data on the total mortality of uh, COVID deaths in India is, 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 is accurate, is, is a bit underdone uh, or is it overdone? Absolutely underestimated. Okay, okay, okay. And there's no doubt about it because most diseases hmm. uh, and human interaction, there's a predictable number of deaths. Yeah. And um, if you look at the worldwide age specific mortality, you'll notice there is a particular curve it makes. Mm -hmm. And every mortality, everywhere in the world, they are all parallel. Mm -hmm. Parallel, if you draw age-specific mortality. There's something predictable about this mortality, and mm -hmm. that is, we use in epidemiology that as a marker for our accuracy. Mm -hmm. It's a, one of the validation uh, right. ideas. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, um, we could from the data available early itself, 2020 May, figure out mm -hmm. the number of deaths expected in India. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if COVID of that virus came and the expected herd immunity was about 60%, how many would die? And the estimated number was 2.2 million. Mm -hmm. Okay. It had to go up after the Delta came because the total infected at the, by the end of pandemic would go up. So naturally mm. it would go up. But you know, the number of reported deaths are infinitely small. Much, much smaller in India. Yeah. And uh, serology showed that infection did occur everywhere. Yes, yes. Initially urban, then rural, and it spread. Right. So, we know there are missing deaths, a large number. Okay. So, okay. so there is no doubt about it. It's sad, but. Mm. So this, uh, this, because I had, uh, you know, uh, the parallel argument is the, is the similar to what I was, uh, was using in my Times of India articles. Uh, uh, India's, uh, the number of the proportion of people over the age of 65, now it affects largely the very adversely people above 75 from the data from, from Sweden, but let's say 65. Our proportion is uh, is very small. I forget the figure, it's about six to 8%, whereas in Sweden, it's 20%. And so that was one issue for me that the age, uh, uh, Pat, you know, the distribution of, uh, of, of India's or structure of India's population uh, is much younger. Uh, so that would actually potentially Keep the numbers down. Number two was the uh, well, well argued cases uh, about uh, the hygiene, lack of hygiene, let's say in India. Uh, because I do have a personal experience that each time I come to India, I manage to get a lot of little colds and little other uh, diseases. But I'm in Australia, I hardly get anything at all for many years, which tells me that uh, people are constantly getting the same uh, treatment that Sunitra Gupta talks about uh, with the minor infections of some sort or the other that then boosts their immune system every year. Uh, therefore, uh, and also the grandparents are playing with grandchildren who are obviously, you go to villages, you know, the nose running down, etc. So my sense was that there's a lack of hygiene, which actually improves uh, the immune system of India, which is the cross reactivity, particularly for coronaviruses. 
And the other was the uh, argument that I think some epidemiologists made that even, you know, fact that there's a lot of BCG, people used to get BCG in India, that that actually had trained the immune system to fight the other types of uh, viruses as well. So what is your view on these three fish issues? So the India's age profile was obviously very dramatically different. And it's an exponential difference between a thousand times difference in, uh, you know, death rate from the lowest to the highest in the COVID case. So if the top end is missing in India, let's say very few, then we expect a proportionately uh, fewer deaths. The second is we expect uh, the potential cross reactivity to also reduce deaths in India where there's much higher existing uh, immunity and also maybe trained immunity. What are your views on these aspects? Well, when I told you I calculated the expected number of deaths, mm. then I went to meet the committee. Mm. The number was 2.2 million. What I did was I applied the age specific what rate of death. Mm. Okay. That would occur if Indian population with its age structure mm. was subjected to infection. Right. So there is age adjustment was, was done. Was done. Yes. So that that is not the reason that the uh, can't be a one. We, uh, yeah, total deaths, I agree with you, because we are a younger population. But the reported number is nowhere near the expected number. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get at. Number two is that uh, my thesis for mm -hmm. my PhD in Johns Hopkins was whether BCG vaccination can prevent leprosy. Other. Now, it's a one example, now leprosy, not tuberculosis. Mm. Now, BCG is a one kind of a mycobacterium. M. lepre is a different kind. Mm. We know in reality there are some cross reactivity possible. Mm. And uh, I don't know even now whether that worked. For example, in, in Velo, we measure the presence of other coronavirus antibodies mm. in the blood of our population. Mm -hmm. And we found 100% had it. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it is there everywhere. So mm. when something is there everywhere, you can't measure whether that works at all. Because some got the COVID, others didn't get the COVID. <laughs> yes, yes. So yes. that doesn't mean... But anything. then you have the comparison with other countries. Let us say you compare with maybe Australia, where I'm sure 100% do not have such, a, you know, antibodies for other coronavirus. Yeah. I'll wait for the data. I have not seen okay. anybody because these people have measured it because everywhere they are found. Mm. In fact, the difficulty we had in getting a proper IgG mm. it was because of the cross reactivity to the other thing. Other. So they had to struggle to get a pick a perfect one. Right. Something else you mentioned earlier, I think I was hoping was will work out much better. There are very good evidence, at least from Germany and some other European country, studies done show vitamin D really alters mortality. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Vitamin okay. D, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, the interesting part is many of the vitamin D studies in India were done in hospitals on staff, anesthesiologists, that's ridiculous. And they all have extremely low level. In fact, most of the studies show that average is below 10 nanograms. I mean, that is horrible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, but we are, I am a public health person. So I did the studies in the villages. Yes. Where the people and are all, the all, yes. yes. And there, all the values were above 30. Yes, indeed. They would be much above okay. 30, yes. Yes. We tried from tribal area, is all above 40. Yes, they're walking so, all the time. I, yeah, so I think average Indian vitamin D was much higher. Correct. And in fact, initially, when the dumb number of deaths were not tally, I was thinking, hoping, because I am an Indian, that really vitamin D is being helpful. Mm -hmm. Because we know even in Germany, the median level of vitamin D is only about 17 nanograms. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I, I, I was hoping for that. Now, remember the vitamin D is your previous vitamin D that makes, you can't give vitamin D and other, mm -hmm. after illness and make no, it. Different. No. So many of the studies didn't show clearly. Mm -hmm. So, but my problem is this, we don't give 
good respect for the data. Mm. We don't. And I know many people died. See, when you take a situation like COVID and say, if you are 60 year old, 70 year old lady, you will be admitted to hospital. There won't be any attendant to look after. You have to find your own bathroom. Which lady from India is going to go to a hospital, a hospital and give no. So they will say, I'd rather die at home. Mm. Okay. So is the problem. Mm. We, we didn't have, we had a system which was bound to give us an underestimate. That, that's what I'm saying is I'm avoiding to, I'm putting blame on nobody. No, I understand. Okay. Uh, the, 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 but I think that this is a good discussion. Really, it clarifies some of the thoughts that I had. Um, I, 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 and that's really helpful. I, I just want to know now back to the system, which, you know, the, the crisis all over the world about the lack of planning for oxygen. And I think the whole point of uh, Modi's uh, arguments and everybody, Vinod Paul's, that lockdowns will give us time to plan for these things and get, you know, prepared. And so I thought that... Uh, at least oxygen, uh, if not the ventilators. I think ventilators not really effective maybe, but at least oxygen uh, was necessary to stockpile uh, before the so-called second wave hit India and, and, and caused havoc. Uh, what do you think about this uh, issue of uh, oxygen? Was there a shortage? Was there a shortage in distribution? Was there some other issue? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you something. The nastiest thing what they did was at the end of it all, somebody announced not a single person died in India because of lack of oxygen. Mm. Politics. That means mm. these jokers are not even contrite. Mm. No. So why no. discuss it? Why discuss it? <laughs> I mean, yes. Kerala did it well. Mm. Okay? Mm. There's an example. And anybody could have done it well. Mm. Oxygen is in free supply in atmosphere. We had the we can we have the technology to send <coughs> spacecraft and things like that. There's nothing wrong. Mm. We just didn't plan. We kept on promising people we will get rid of the virus by such and such a date. Mm. Okay. But did nothing to plan for uh, contingencies. Yes. Mm. Yeah. I see. So yeah. So that's exactly uh, I think uh, the issue with. Uh, with the kind of policies uh, of India that I have resigned my job for and, uh, you know, been fighting to change the system. Uh, I won't go into details there. That's quite a big topic separately. <laughs> so we'll leave that there. Now, I, when I came to India from Australia on the 10th of August, I landed here on, I think, 10th or 11th of August. Um, I was a bit shocked to find that even though there was no COVID uh, virtually, you know, it had fizzled out by that time. I found that there was some kind of a requirement to wear a mask, even when you're driving alone in the car. And that if you didn't do that, then there were these police people going and harassing people and getting, giving them 2,000 rupee fines. And they, by the way, they did not even bother that they were wearing a proper N95 mask or a, even a surgical mask. Even a simple, ordinary cloth mask was considered to be suitable <laughs> by, the, by the court system. What is the view on this absurd mania in India for masks? <laughs> well, uh, I... <laughs> The thing is, I, I, I know this, uh, my son had to pay mm. the fine for traveling in his own car alone. Own car alone, yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so we can have this. In fact, when I, I came from Nepal and I was locked, put in a, in a what do you call, household uh, quarantine. Mm. Uh, this is on 5th of March, 2020. Mm -hmm. And for 21, 30, 35 days. Goodness. So, see, listen, what has happened is we gave the whole system of control of the disease to a body which has no experience in healthcare. You understand? I'm not naming the body. Is that the Vinod Paul uh, Committee? <laughs> no, 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 no. A body in India uh -huh. who looked after. I this included that. police and some kind of uh, auxiliary health staff mm. coming and closing down the houses and things like that. Mm. So the point is that in an election campaign, you don't need to wear a mask. Mm. In India, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nor if you are on a, some religious program, then mm. it's also you are protected. Yes. So there is no sense in it, you know. No There's absolutely no. And uh, that, that repeated teaching, saying that, 
use mask you know in- intelligently you know mm. you don't sit in your uh, bed and think, uh, put a mask <laughs> on and hope i remember somebody yeah. when i was giving a talk asked mm. me the question mm. i wash my hands very frequently mm. as i keep washing my hand will my immunity improve okay i said all it will happen is your hand will be cleaner and cleaner okay mm-hmm. your immunity won't change not affected mm. so the thing is people get wrong impressions about all this thing mm. and that's sad <clears throat> yeah so we have the situation this is uh, the data in front of our eyes when we open them um, i think it's a well over 80% uh, you know uh, uh, says what do you call this uh, antibodies in india the measured antibodies so well over the herd immunity level and yet we have this uh, mask thing and then i'm noticing that people are wearing masks uh, you know either badly or they're putting a kind of a very loose cloth so i think the high court of india or whatever the court was has also something to explain and this uh, this order has not yet been retracted even though there is no a real evidence of uh, you know at the third wave or whatever this is basically finished in india uh, but this madness continues so i think we have a bit of group psychology operating here something more <laughs> something different from medical science right okay now i want to get your views on there's a india has been supporting or discussing a common uh, vaccine passport so mr modi had gone and uh, was discussing uh, vaccine passport with other countries okay we should have a common one uh, ma- a vaccine passport basically is a massive dis- discriminatory thing uh, that it says that unless you are vaccinated you cannot really travel and you have to prove this otherwise your you know your entire freedom is curtailed it therefore is almost effectively a mandatory vaccine because uh, those who have to travel uh, necessarily have to take a you know a vaccine and a vaccine as far as i understand and i've looked at the data and i'm sure you have uh, in the kind of risk profile of this particular virus it is it is very helpful for uh, the elderly um, in my view above 65 75 to take it uh, to consider it uh but for the younger people the uh, the trade offs are very uh, questionable uh, cost benefit and particularly where you already have had uh, natural immunity like in a country like india why would there be a need for a vaccine passport so what's your uh, uh, theoretical and uh, you know recommendation for policies on this issue there is very good evidence that natural infection gives you robust and long lasting immunity okay and in fact please remember that at the beginning of the pandemic we were warned this particular virus will not induce any you know long term adaptive, mm-hmm. adaptive immunity mm-hmm. and then they found antibody then they said yeah but they are not neutralizing antibody mm-hmm. then they found neutralizing antibody and then they said oh that won't last long now the day is the suspicious group who the day who knows all these thing in advance even before it emerges mm. okay and uh, and then luckily we have some british do very good studies mm. swedes do israelites do and recently the israelites published a paper an excellent one on the comparison of the how good the immunity is from natural infection mm. as compared to vaccination mm. now this is important from india's yes. point of view because and it shows a much better performance after natural infection mm. i'm not saying so choose natural infection because the natural infection study can't be done on a randomized controlled trial Hmm. okay so yes. we take the people who have survived hmm. so the survivors are the ones who came out of it fine yes okay so we are forgetting the ones who died died that's but right. now now we are talk about india as a large number of survivors yes. who have finished the covid hmm. now why you want to inject them with the vaccine hmm. absolutely no need hmm. protection thing if it wanes off in 5 years mm. we we'll think about it then exactly. exactly and many of these things body has long lasting immunity yes. and absolute rubbish this mm. is and children mm. there's no need for vaccination because the outcomes are excellent mm. and if they get naturally infected they will have long lasting immunity yes okay so this is this is a un- very strange thing has happened that uh, 
uh, epidemiologists who are the so-called you know experts in that area are saying exactly what you're saying and yet the policy makers across the world have gone berserk and they are uh, imposing vaccine passports which are effectively mandatory vaccines australia is a very good example of that by the way uh, you can't leave australia uh, without the vaccine. I actually was allowed to leave because of my father's uh, issue. I haven't decided about a vaccine personally. I'm, I'm still in that uh, 61, 62 age group. I've got no other comorbidities. I'm looking at the data and saying my risk is relatively low. Um, the, bene uh, the risk from va uh, vaccine is also a small risk is there. So I haven't decided. But my mother has taken, my father I cannot take now because of cancer. But I think for the elderly, it makes a lot of sense to consider this. Even if it's a short term thing, you know, that uh, uh, immunity of the va uh, vaccine is the same, maybe for one year. It's still a better is an improvement to their chances, uh, people like my mother, etc. Then uh, you know, for a younger person, where uh, they can easily get uh, maybe uh, longer lasting immunity. I'm not saying they should go and get it, as you rightly said, but uh, these are the good trade offs, right? So the next question I have is about a very controversial issue in in, in Australia for some reason. I've, uh, there's a, there are two groups of people. One of them who are very advocate, uh, frantic advocates of ivermectin, and they cite India's example. Uh, as uh, the India actually had uh, fewer cases because ivermectin was used everywhere. Now, I have uh, had a look at the overall picture and I'm, from the st statistical perspective, I am I'm not persuaded by the studies on either side. They're very small studies. The, the All India Institute, for example, Bhubaneswar, as you might be aware, they did the study initially, which said there was a, is an observational study and they said, yes, in the hospital, there was an improvement, uh, noticeable improvement. So the ICMR recommended it for some time. And then the All Institute in Delhi did the study and then they said, no, we couldn't find the evidence. So then the ICMR removed their recommendation. Have you had a look at this uh, time to look at these studies and did you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the use of ivermectin in India? Because I know it's freely available. Uh, many doctors recommended it, but uh, how effective was it found? Is, is it, has it saved lives and so on? Yeah. To my knowledge, there is no evidence that it did. To my knowledge, mm. and uh, and please remember, there is a vociferous India, and there is a big silent India. Mm. The big silent India has never heard of ivermectin. Mm. Okay, those who go to hospital that they can afford private practitioner, then they have heard of it. So I don't take that kind of a line that India's mortality is low because of ivermectin. Mm. I explain to you, India's mortality is not low. Not low. Yeah, so that that is not a good ex experience at all. Uh, well, there are things that you go, you know, when you do studies, mm -hmm. we go by what is called as a p-value, statistically significant. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean that is a little tricky business, especially when it comes to observational study. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what I am saying is, convincing evidence is required before you say a particular therapeutic intervention makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Now, when Corona came, the fear was so much. Anybody said the tamarind is good, they'll take tamarind. Okay. Mm. Now, you know what is the harm? It doesn't hurt you. No. It, so, it, same thing happens in ivermectin. Say mm. no harm, take it. it does, it's a safe drug. Mm. Now, that way, I think we have, can have any number of drugs, but <laughs> I don't have any mm. evidence to support it. That's that's exactly more. I think it is uh, the case with ivermectin. So, a lot of people are very uh, passionate about it. And they cite India as an example because there are some vociferous people, like you said, who have made it their business to promote this uh, thing. And uh, some of the people are, uh, who are un, uh, relatively unable to distinguish the quality of studies, uh, they, they, they have fallen for this trap and they think that this is a magic solution and, and so on. So uh, I think these are the broad questions. I won't go into issues like uh, vaccine quality and and, and and so on. Those are matters I think I, I will let the data evolve. I just had one last thing for you. Is there anything else that you want uh, to talk about uh, in relation to pandemic management of the sort? You said this should not happen again. How can we prevent it? What are your thoughts in general? And what are your last thoughts for this interview? <clears throat> we have to do a lot of things administratively, structurally, in terms of manage, looking forward. But currently, my problem is something which I, you alluded to you earlier, but who is the leader who will take us out of the pandemic? You know, you've got to stop wearing masks, you know, um, 
masks are good in certain situation but they becoming at a ridiculous level mm. and eventually after 90% of the population are immune mm. so what the heck are you doing about it? Mm. so and we have to have a way of coming up now even now if you don't wear a helmet and you take a bike in velo somebody may stop you and get your rt pcr done mm. so every one of these things are no. punitive mm. now health is a people's issue mm. and people are not there they are being treated oh. like mm. uh, in some kind of a cattle mm. so i think we need to give it back to them their autonomy mm. their liberty and somebody has to lead the way mm. saying no more of disaster management business disaster management was self was a disaster mm. so now let us let people be responsible mm. those who want to take vaccine tell them where you can get it and how good it is and if some reason you don't feel like that's also up to you because it has no no merit in terms of say take a vaccine so that you can protect others no mm, no it doesn't do it mm. so for your safety you want please take it mm. that is all we can say and now the hospitals are empty mm. there is no man the disaster going on i think we should turn up new leaf and say forget that is past new mutant may come yeah okay big meteorite may strike strike a city <laughs> mm. we can't do a damn thing about it exactly yeah so i don't think we should allow people to waste time children not going to school even now mm. so not on we no, have no. some leadership we need to mm. take the country back to pre covid time uh that's very well said uh, dr mulel because uh, that's exactly what uh, our party's message has been from day 1 reason rationality focus on genuine science focus on people's health looking at the entire picture all or not just a single thing and uh, uh, i've been trying to build young leaders who will take this message i'm also in touch with a lot of is officers of my entire batch uh, on whatsapp we have a group of about 80 people i'll share this interview with them they are all you know retired recently as secretaries of government of india and uh, many other <laughs> positions are very senior ones these people and also i have got as i said 100 uh, bit elderly is officers i'll share this interview with them as well i'll share it on the you know whatever social media channels i have i think the message you've given in the end is the that the pandemic should stop somehow we we need to call it like the who declared the pandemic somebody has to stop to say the pandemic is over so that has uh, i think the most important point you mentioned because it feels a bit absurd uh when people are wearing this mask i can't recognize people i go to the hospital practically every sec- second day i'm going for my father's treatment i can't recognize the, the doctors faces and the doctors ner- nurse i can't recognize anyone's face because they all wearing masks and i'm i'm forced to wear a mask so now the thing is masks are causing so much damage in terms of social relationships when there is no need maybe when there was a need n95 i was very happy that you know my father will wear n95 when he's interacting with other people n95 i think is some evidence surgical a bit less but cloth masks that's considered valid in india and at a time when there is no covid in the first place and uh, the and uh, the pcr test uh, is the most shocking that you mentioned that you know even for not wearing a helmet they get to tested and that's very expensive as well as uh, by the way they require my father to be tested every two weeks for a pcr for any treatment in the hospital so uh, and this negative everywhere you know so the, the the issue for and of course the pcr quality is a separate issue i'm not going to details uh, i i'll keep in touch with you dr milel because i've been i'll be uh, completing a cost benefit analysis i have finished a book uh, which i wrote uh, when i resigned my job i'll share the uh, book with you uh, actual document with you uh will be very grateful to uh, you know i'll be talking to dr jay bhattacharya i'm assuming you know him very well i'll i'll uh, share this interview with him he will share it on twitter i i really hope the message that you have given about india's uh, you know uh, mismanagement will be heard at the highest possible level so a person of your eminence a person of your stature has been saying such things for the last 18 months 20 20 months and have not been heard because you did it very politely and calmly i think there's time for people like me to make a bit of a ruckus and to to raise uh, my voice and say we should bring india back to normal now all right that's a wonderful thank you uh, uh, interview uh, dr molail uh, thank you for sparing your time i really appreciate that